This all started with a tweet. Uh, the tweet was, My wife has just started working with an autistic girl in reception. One of her targets is to make greater eye contact, or something along those lines. Is this appropriate? No. <laughs> But I can see why people gave her that target or thought it might be useful. Perhaps it was a target requested by her parents who want to have a greater sense of communication with her. To them, eye contact is a part of that communication and the understanding would be that if she gives eye contact, she will pay better attention, she'll hear more of what's said. It's a common misunderstanding. Perhaps it's understood as being socially useful to her. If she does not give eye contact, people will think she's rude, that she's not listening. But if she is actually listening, is she being rude? Are they right? The people noting her lack of eye contact and understanding it as a sign of inattention and then concluding that she is rude, are the people making the mistake? It's the misunderstanding of rudeness where no rudeness is. The misunderstanding isn't caused by the lack of eye contact, it's caused by the lack of understanding. And if you're looking to remediate this situation, you fix the lack of understanding, not the lack of eye contact. Imagine you had something important you wanted to tell me, and I could listen to you in one of two ways. I could stand with my hand on the wall and pay 100% attention, or I could stand with my hand on my head and pay 50% attention. Which would you want me to do? And what would you think if I did the other one? The misunderstandings that happen between neurotypical people and neurodivergent people are like the misunderstandings between cats and dogs. Cats think dogs are angry when they wag their tail and dogs think cats are angry when they purr. Trying to make a cat wag its tail in happiness isn't useful to the cat. And what's more, it won't turn it into a dog. Plus, you can't train a cat. You might stand a better chance with the dog. Imagine if you put a strategy in place to support the cat in becoming a dog. I imagine it would take a very long time. Um, you'd measure progress in small units. The cat would probably become distressed, even if the cat wanted to be a dog. Maybe it would fight back. And if you were ultimately successful, what would the cost of that success be to the cat? You'd end up with a very sad cat, a broken cat, a cat that needed a lot of help and support to be able to be a cat again. Because ultimately, however great its impression of a dog, it would always remain a cat. Some interventions and therapies view autism as a behaviour when it is a brain difference. If autism were a behaviour, then strategies that replace behaviour with another behaviour would help, not harm. But it is a brain difference, and these strategies do real harm. Being aware of this helps you to protect the children who have hidden differences, like neurodivergent conditions who are in your care. Targets like make eye contact are based on the assumption that neurotypical methods of communication are right, and work better than other forms of communication. It's like deciding a cat ought to be a dog. I'm a qualified teacher. What's of interest to me when I teach students of all ages is that they're taking in what I'm saying, that they're listening, that they're understanding. If my aim is to teach them, then that's what matters. If my aim is to homogenise them, then I might prioritise getting them to look the same over learning. But I don't think there's any teachers out there that want to do this. A simple way to audit targets for autistic students, and indeed for any other students, is to ask what the utility is to that student of that target. What use is it for them to achieve this target? What use for them? Is the purpose of this target a service to them, or is it just to make them appear a certain way? Is the target essentially wishing away the difference, the disability? Imagine setting a target for a wheelchair user of pretending to stand up. And that's essentially what the target of eye contact asks autistics to do. Please could you pretend to not be autistic? And the scary thing about the make eye contact target is that not only is it not useful to that child, it actively does harm. There's oodles of research that shows that masking, the mastering the art of pretending not to be autistic, 
damages emotional well-being and mental health. And we know this not only from neurodivergent populations, but from other populations who've been asked to pretend to not be who they are. For example, the LGBTQ plus population. So let's think about it again. Imagine you have two people. This person has great social understanding, copes with change well, etc. And they're thought of as a great communicator. And this person communicates in more idiosyncratic ways. They're not regarded as a great communicator. These two people are conversing and a misunderstanding is occurring. Whose job is it to fix it? Communication is co-constructed. Who's more able to fix it? Is it this person? Because it's always this person that gets asked, or is it this person? I bet you've got really great empathy. You wouldn't be bothering to watch a film like this if you didn't care enormously for the students that you support. So try it. Try reconceiving the rules around conversation, because they're just social constructs. They're not set in stone. We are free to reimagine them if we want to. And if we do, if we can, then we can create new ones. And in doing so, create a society where more forms of communication are recognised as valid and less misunderstandings occur. So, to me, as an autistic person, direct eye contact feels confrontational. It's like people squaring off in a fight, you know, when people go up to each other like that. I will check eyes for emotions, but only briefly. I can gather loads of information at a glance. Autistic people have heightened visual processing, so it's not just a, a wild claim. There's a neurological basis to it. Side-by-side -side vision, you know, looking together in a common direction, sharing gaze on an object, feels friendly. It feels companionable. We're together. We're going somewhere side by side. Cats will half close their eyes as a sign of respect. It means I trust you enough not to look at you. You know? See, you can do it. You can reimagine these things. We could have more than one accepted way of listening and more than one understanding of the rules of communication. So how about setting that little girl's class a target? of understanding how she listens to them. In my next film, I'm going to explore this tweet a little bit more and consider what that target could have been.